Welcome back to Political Capital, the intersection of money and politics. In 1998, when first emerged the allegations that there was possibly fraudulent and corrupt activity with regards to the arms deal, Esop Pahad was a minister in the presidency. He sat down with me to discuss how he views the arms deal case, Jacob Zuma, and some of the allegations that have been made against him. But you've got to find a way in which you're going to get out of this factional fighting inside the ANC. The question of Zuma's trial that will start in, in Durban on Friday is that, in my view, those who are supporting Zuma mm -hmm. must not use the opportunity to bring in ethnicity into the politics of the ANC and the politics of our country. Mm -hmm. Because if we ethnicize politics in South Africa, we're going to tread a very, very dangerous road. Mm. And so they need to say that they're coming out in support of Zuma, they want to be in solidarity with Zuma, that's fine, but not to ethnicize the politics, not to say this is a Zulu, we are supporting the Zulus, they are charging us because we are Zulus. Mm. That is a very dangerous cause. Let's speak about the case itself. I mean, it's been nearly, what, a decade since these charges were first brought to bear. What do you make of this case right now? Well, look, as they say, the going saying goes, the long arm of the law might take a long time, but it has to take its course. It had to take its course. But whether or not <laughs> how the trial will unfold, by the way, is another matter, mm -hmm. because quite clearly uh, his legal t team have already indicated they are going to challenge mm -hmm. uh, the prosecution's uh, thing about bringing them to trial. So they're, going to, they're not even challenging the, the charges at the moment, just challenging the right and they think that uh, he shouldn't be tried because they, there isn't enough uh, evidence before them. What do you think? So now that's going to take, oh, that's going to take a long time. Mm -hmm. Because you lose here, yeah, then you appeal, then you appeal. Now I want to say this, people have been accusing Zuma of appealing the trials all the time. But that's his right. You can't have the rule of law which says there's a presumption of innocence and which gives everybody the right, including mass murderers, the right to appeal their cases. So Zuma has the right to appeal his case, which he will do. Now whether or not this trial will finish in the next few years, I think remains to be seen. So it's, 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 it's going to be with us, which I think is unfortunate because it will just further weakens the ANC. I think it will cause further divisions in the ANC. Uh, but that's his right to, to use the judicial processes. Mm -hmm. and, and, that, and that he and his lawyers are definitely going to do. So I'm not even sure to what extent the trial will take off. Look, and it's going to get postponed immediately, as is usual in all these cases. This case in particular that President Zuma will be going to court for on Friday, it relates to the arms deal and the procurement of arms by the state. And there are allegations of impropriety there. But the case itself was known to the public earlier than when Kote Tim She gave the decision. There were earlier whistleblowers. One of them, former ANC MP, Andrew Feinstein, says that you yourself, as of Pahad, try to muzzle him when he brought up this issue no, in was, a parliamentary yeah, committee. Andrew was quite right. It was our political committee. Did you try to muzzle him? No, it's not muzzling. And that's why Andrew sometimes must also tell the truth. So what did book. you do? He told his version to CNBC no, Africa. It, it, what happened was it was a meeting of the political committee mm -hmm. of which I was a member. And we had to discuss whether it's right or wrong for an ANC MP to come out against the policy position of the movement in Parliament. But the policy, I think, according and to him, was said, inherently no, flawed. No, the policy of the ANC at that time was that there were these other processes going on, 
and, and, and parliamentary communists must do their work, Andrew was coming out against the positions of the movement. And for me, that was incorrect, and I said so. I said, Andrew can't be allowed. Because if you allow Andrew to come out against the policies of the movement, then how do you stop anybody else from doing so? And where previously, for example, people who, for religious reasons, couldn't support the termination of pregnancy, mm -hmm. but we said to them, apply for special dispensation. That is not a legal issue. The state with us in the forefront of society and the consciousness of political South Africa for 10 years. That was just one no, issue. No, no, no. But what, you see, what, you ask me a question. Okay. I'm answering your question now. Did I muzzle Andrew Feinstein? No. The point that Andrew Feinstein is trying to make is that this issue could have been put before the courts much earlier if there was no political mechanization no. at the back that stopped it from even getting but to the forefront. what are you talking about? First of all, Bulelani, mm -hmm. uh, when he was uh, director of public prosecution, made a public statement which he shouldn't have. Mm -hmm. uh, that although there was prima facie evidence against Zuma, he did not think there was enough evidence to convict him, and therefore he's not going to be charged, and Shabir Sheikh will be charged. Now, you can't then say you want to have that position independent of government, which it is, by the way. Mm -hmm. And government has no right to interfere with the prosecutors, no right, none whatsoever. And then say the government should have interfered in the work of an independent institution. It's an independent institution. They took their decisions, right or wrong. I think Bulelani was wrong. I think most people agree Bulelani was wrong, that they should have charged him at the same time as Shabir Sheikh. I think Impesha was wrong. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the reason he gave. Uh, to drop in the charges. The, to, to, to drop the charges. Now the courts have found against him. But you could not force, and you should never force, mm -hmm. the public uh, prosecutor uh, to take uh, political decisions because then you interfering with the judiciary and the arm of the law, and that is independent. And so I think you must get facts straight here, Okay. That, that this is exactly what happened. It wasn't the government's position. But Andrew Feinstein was speaking about the arms deal from a position of parliament. He was a member of parliament, so he was speaking about the fact that there must be an open conversation within parliament about the arms deal and how it will be handled. These conversations only happened much, much later. No, no. And not necessarily... Now, you just read a book and you think that <laughs> what the man says in the book is all true. <laughs> so, look, the fact of the matter is that this matter was discussed in the structures of the ANC. Mm -hmm. Now, people may say that we came to a wrong decision. That's, of course, it's entirely up to them. We've said, and I maintain now, now, mm -hmm. even now with this interview with you, that they will not find any wrongdoing, I think, in the primary contracts. You see, the government is responsible only for the primary contracts. The secondary contracts that the primary contractor enters into has nothing to do with the government, has nothing to do with the contract you sign. Mm. So if your station signs a contract with you, mm -hmm. and you go and do something else, uh, sign a secondary contract with somebody else, I don't know what happens in that case, but in this case, so what you have to prove is not that there was corruption in the secondary context. There was, unfortunately. But you have to prove that there was corruption in the primary context. Now, w I was not involved as a minister in that. We had a special ministerial team that was led by Thabo Mbeki, mm -hmm. uh, which, which, which had to uh, deal with this thing. But when it was reported to cabinet, and when the, the then Auditor General, by the way, they're rubbishing him now. And he found, no, that's not true. There was no uh, corruption in the primary contract. So I'm saying, if you want to go back to Andrew Feinstein, then go back and ask him, have you got any proof uh, that there was corruption in the primary contract? And if you have proof of the corruption in the primary contract, who was it that was responsible for that corruption? That, 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 that's what I'm saying. Let me ask you a question. What do you think of the Sereti Commission? 
the what commission? The CRT commission. Look the commission at the, that investigated You set up the a commission. Unsealed. The commission comes out with the report you don't like. And by and large, a lot of you in the media reject the commission like you're doing now and say, but why are you not producing the evidence? Do you? To, no, no. Why are you not producing the evidence to say that the Sereti Commission was wrong for the following reasons? I did not read the report. I just read what was in the media. And what do you think? But for me, no. He, he made a report. He, he, he was a judge. He is a well-respected well judge. And I say that for me, his findings stand unless and until somebody else disproves him or he's disproved in a court of law. Look, in the end, where there is a serious dispute about law, only a court of law can make the final judgment. And in our case, it can only be the constitutional court that can make the final judgment. Once the constitutional court makes a judgment, that's final. And that hasn't happened yet. So I think where we must not conflate and confuse mm -hmm. our processes with the final product. The final product can only be through the Constitutional Court. On the eve of South Africa's biggest court case yet, we took to the streets to find out the support that Jacob Zuma still enjoys in his home province. Here's what some had to say. I think it's good that uh, our former president is going to, to court. He's going to finally have his day in court. No, I think, it's, I think it's very unfair what he did. He stole a lot of money from the taxpayers. So I think he should go to jail. Um, I feel that it's just great because um, he was also with um, Shavia Sheikhs in the beginning and their fraud scams. He went to prison. I'm, I'm sure it's his son to go to jail now for all the wrong that he's done. I think it's a very good thing for uh, political justice to be seen to be done. I think he'll be uh, dismissed as well. The case will be dismissed against him. He's my president, and I appreciate what he's done for our country. Well, from the Durban High Court, that's where we wrap this edition of Political Capital. Remember, CNBC Africa will be bringing you every minute of the court case tomorrow starting from 9 a.m. It is very much expected that former President Jacob Zuma will make his way up the stairs for his first court appearance. Stay tuned to CNBC Africa for more. From us here, it's goodbye.